Hello and welcome. I am Liz Shaybaker, CEO of Versant Capital Management, a wealth management and investment firm located in Phoenix, Arizona. Today, we are going to talk about coping during COVID and some of the tools that can positively impact your well being and boost your state of mind. I will be your webinar host, and I am joined by mental health experts Deborah Onsager and Dr. Jane Kaplan. Deborah is a private practice therapist in the field of human development and is a recognized expert in the treatment of PTSD and other trauma-related psychological conditions. She is an advisor to a multi-generational family-owned business and consults on psychological issues for law firms. Deborah has a bachelor's degree in social work from Arizona State University and a master's degree in counseling from Northern Arizona University. Dr. Kaplan, or Jane, as we call her, because she is our friend, is a board certified child adolescent and adult psychiatrist. Her practice specializes in psychopharmacology, <laughs> it's a mouthful, and psychotherapy with special interests in attachment theory, trauma, addiction, and depression. She completed her adult psychiatry residency at the Harvard Longwood program and her pediatric fellowship at Harvard at Massachusetts General and McLean Hospitals. Welcome, Deborah and Jane. Thank you for joining us. Before we get started, I do want to go over a few housekeeping things. Uh, please note that all webinar attendees are muted. Please use the chat function on the right side to ask questions or comment. The chats are private and are being managed by our moderator, Anne, who's behind the scenes. Your questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. The webinar will be sent to you for replay. And if you have any connection issues while watching the webinar, please press the red reconnect button on the top of your screen. So Deborah and Jane, let's go ahead and get started. I think it's safe to say that it's no surprise that most of us have been affected by the pandemic to some degree on mental, emotional, social, business related and or a financial level. So how can we rise above these challenges? Well, first of all, Liz, thank you so much for inviting us to have this conversation with you and with your clients. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to share our experience and point of view and offer ideas that we know will be helpful to people. Um, I think just kind of getting started before we can move forward, we really have to understand the significant impact that COVID has had on us as individuals, as families, as communities, as a country, and really as a world. And absent that understanding, um, we will not really have a robust or full picture of how we can move forward. And so looking at COVID through the lens of um, that it impacts on multiple levels, um, it is transboundaried, it um, has really, um, you know, been a part of every little piece of our lives over the last seven months. Um, so that has been, I think, a very big thing. And in addition to that, we have other stressors, for instance, the political landscape right now, regardless of where you're coming from, it is in the background. And so we have COVID, we have the political landscape, we ha have what's happening um, in other ways around the country. Um, you know, sometimes I kind of joke, um, you know, when are we going to have the, the locust plague? You know, it's, it's, you know, what's around the corner? And Jane and I, I will tell you, this is not going to be all doom and gloom, but I think we need to kind of look at some of the sobering aspects of, of COVID. Um, Jane, what would you add to that? Well, you know, I was just looking at this slide. You are here. And it reminds me if you've ever been to the mall and you lose your bearings and you try to find the directions and you're looking at the map trying to figure out where the heck you are and then you see the little arrow with the you are here. I feel like with COVID, 
we've all sort of lost our bearings and we're wondering, okay, where, where are we and where are my reference points? Absolutely. That is exactly where we are. And we're taking stock of that right now. Um, you know, when we look at um, where COVID has landed us right now, um, we have, have some other impacts. For instance, um, we have lost our experience of time passing. Normally, we mark time passing, you know, by the passage of months and seasons and uh, graduations and um, vacations and travel plans. But if you think about it, the last seven months have been pretty much all um, consolidated. So time itself has been impacted. And in addition, we have the effects on us from an evolution of our survival brain that has brought into account things like very real things like our fears of death our fears of, is there enough um, food? Is there going to be access to important things like healthcare? Um, and these are things that really all by themselves are gonna activate us into a feeling of stress. Um, and then we just have ordinary life events um, that come into play. So this is kind of the beginning of where we started this slide. Um, back in, in March. And it wasn't that we didn't take COVID seriously. It was that I think we brought our good old American know-how, roll up your sleeves, and we're going to just, we're going to power through this. And so the humor had a lightheartedness to it. We were going to have the longest spring break in history. <laughs> and um, the idea of, I hope the weather is good tomorrow for my trip to Porta Backyarda. I'm getting tired of lost living room. So it's, you know, we, we were playful with it. Um, you know, oh, we I, I know my kids, when it first hit, they were so excited to be at home. We set up badminton, volleyball, basketball, sport ball <laughs> in the backyard. <laughs> and I realized at that point I was only equipped to be a PE teacher and nothing more than <laughs> <laughs> right. But it was fun, you know, and it was a break from the ordinary life. And I think in the beginning, so many people were talking about, you know, especially if they had the financial means to take the break, take the step back. A lot of people were expressing, hey, this isn't such a bad thing that's happening right now. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's absolutely true. And those opportunities that we saw you know, to organize my spices and clean out my junk drawer. Um, those were really all present for a little window. Um, that quickly evaporated. Mm -hmm. And um, we I had good intentions. We did. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly. I looked and my garage got cleaned out. That was a significant undertaking. <laughs> yeah. But I, I mean, everyone... I you know, everyone did that and everyone initially saw the opportunity. And I think that is, you know, the beginning of resilience. But then as time went on, as you expressed, Deborah, time started to change and shift. And a week, two weeks, a month, three months, the landscape started to change. It really did. Um, and I think part of it is that we just had no reference point for predicting what was, what was to come. Um, in our lifetime. So, you know, here we see an example still of humor, um, you know, plentiful, um, but with some flavors of what was happening as people, uh, their coping skills were stretched. And so people started relying more on things like, uh, you know, the whatever was in the refrigerator, um, maybe drinking an extra glass of wine, um, those sort of coping skills started kicking in and some very positive coping skills kicked in. You know, I will say in our neighborhood, we saw many, many more people out walking every day. The weather was good here in Phoenix and um, people were really searching for ways to make the best of a bad situation. But there started to be set in a certain fatigue and weariness and that started to happen 
probably around the end of the school year because kids didn't go back to school after spring break. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you guys have kids at home, how that had impacted you. Well, I think, you know, I was lucky because my kids were a bit older, 11 and 12, but I do know for other people who had younger children, children with learning disabilities, ADHD, um, you know, it was a real challenge to try to work and try to become a teacher and keep their kids on task, going, looking through the material. I know for me when, you know, my son in seventh, eighth grade starts to get into math, and he starts asking me questions, <laughs> you know, I'm out. And it was okay for us, but I know for a lot of people th that presents a real challenge. Plus the uncertainty of not knowing what your child is going to be doing day to day, how that was, what that's going to look like, how everyone's gonna navigate online. So I think it, I think it definitely presented challenges. Yeah. Definitely. And I don't know um, if you heard in your practice, but I think around this time, people that I had been seeing for therapy, more of the serious issues started coming forward. I had people who initially joked about an extra glass of wine at night were then coming in and saying, you know, I'm having half a bottle or a bottle. Or, you know, I haven't worked out for three or four months. That was okay, but my stress levels are really high and I'm not sleeping. So we start yeah. to hear more and more serious symptoms. Did that happen with you, Deborah? Yes, it really did. And I think that makes such a great point is that all of the things that we could re rely on before, um, just going out to dinner or the ease of going to the grocery store. Now you're making these, these decisions or you know having food delivery. I know a lot of people found uh, ways around that, but it was, you know, kind of coming into this kind of stay in place order. And then it just really felt like we were in a very serious situation um, that we had to kind of step back and take stock of. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where people's survival instincts started to kick in. And we're going to get into, you know, the wiring of the central nervous system, and how the brain can kick into survival mode and what that neurobiology looks like. But we started to see that enacted when people were panicked over toilet paper, meat, chicken, groceries, pasta. I mean, it was the first time I had ever gone to Costco and all the pasta was gone out of the aisle. And when you see that happening, that further creates anxiety and survival mode about is there going to be enough. Will we get through this? So things dramatically worsened when those instincts start to kick in in our brain. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that um, that survival piece is really what we're talking about is the part of the brain that kicks us all into fight or flight. And we're going to talk some more about that. Jane's going to go over that. But I think the other part with the fight or flight is that it sends us into a state of heightened alertness, heightened awareness. Um, we're getting constant surges of adrenaline and cortisol, which we're really not evolutionarily prepared to handle. We have basically the same systems as um, our you know, ancient cavemen and women had. So what we started to find is that actually the humor started to change. Um, and you can see it here is in this meme. Um, I found a copy of the government plan to reopen the economy. I'm not sure if it's state or federal. And it, you know, it, you can't help but chuckle at it because it does represent what we were all feeling is where is this going? Who's in charge? Um, who's making decisions? And at that point, we were getting, and still are getting at times, a lot of conflicting information. And people um, had reactions to the stay in place and to different um, forms of trying to get a handle on COVID. Definitely. You know, the brain is looking for certainty and knowing what to expect. 
And that's why we do a lot of the same things over and over. We're always looking for that certainty, that safety, that predictability. And when we were faced with a situation that was uncertain, unpredictable, unstable, and someone like government also was struggling to find the answers that were very elusive and that no one could have right away, we really saw people's anxiety and that survival mode amp up a few more notches. That's right. I, I think where we got, I personally got a little concerned about it was when people would get very angry, hostile, blaming, accusatory, pointing the finger. When I was thinking, okay, this is a time that we really need to come together. We need to join forces. We need to all mobilize together. We need to realize we're working for a common goal. Sometimes the answers in life aren't easy, but we've got to sort of stay with it and stay together in order to get to a solution. And I would say that some of the polarization we're seeing, you know, is reflective of people's struggle to sort of hang in there and feel like they are going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think the, um, the other part of it is, um, you know, when you talk about all of those features of, you know, high anxiety and unpredictability, is, um, you know, just kind of how that does trickle out to relationships and our ability to stay um, agile, to stay uh, present to what is coming up and not reactive, uh, mm -hmm. really looking to be more responsive. There was a great uh, book that I think I picked up around this time um, by Pima Chodron. She's an American woman who became a Buddhist monk and she translates Buddhist philosophy uh, in a way that's very easily readable. But she wrote a book called Living with Uncertainty. And it just came out about a year ago and the timing was perfect. So what she talks about is that all of us resist the idea of living with uncertainty because it's uncomfortable. But uncertainty, if you really think about it, that is life. Life is uncertain, whether we're in COVID or we're not in COVID. But when we're not in COVID, we just pretend to ourselves that it is certain and that we know what's happening day to day. But actually, we don't. So her whole theory boils down to just trying to come to terms and acceptance with the fact that life is uncertain and that you may never be comfortable with it, but that as you get used to it, you can embrace some of its positive qualities because with uncertainty, also comes mystery, intrigue, surprises, excitement. So it sort of depends which side of the coin you're looking at. And I thought that was a really helpful book for me at this time when all of this was going on. I think that's a, a very helpful book. And, so actually, and actually, you know, this is a funny slide because even Jennifer <laughs> is looking a little haggard here. Because, you know, some of the things that we all relied on, especially as women, you know, I didn't have my hair colored. I wasn't getting my Botox. The wrinkles are coming out. You know, my hair is getting a little frayed on the ends. I don't know how you two ladies dealt with that, but that also was not helping me feel good about the situation at hand. Not at all. Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> No, it sent me to my refrigerator. <laughs> right, right. No, it's so true. All of those things were unavailable to us. And all the things that we have come to rely on to help us cope and help us um, feel better and give us positive reinforcement um, for all of our hard work. And it was really having to kind of dial back on a lot of that. And I think everybody began to recognize it's way too early to talk about any kind of new new normal, but we moved out of kind of a positive, optimistic, we're going to get through this. And, you know, first it was the first part of the summer and then our plans got changed for travel. And then it was, well, we'll, we'll do it in the fall. We'll get to our European trip then. And then that got canceled. 
and this got canceled and this wasn't available. And, um, you know, after a while, it's kind of like, okay, we need to step back and really take a closer look at this. What do we need to have in place um, to move us forward so that we can manage what's ahead, not just what's here right now, but what is ahead. And again, this is, this is a slide that is representative of really where we started to feel some despair and um, that COVID was not gonna be a quick fix. Um, we were sheltering in place. You know, here we have Times Square that's completely empty. And this is very much for all of us an altered reality. This is not something that we have any kind of experience with in our lifetimes. And so it, it is sobering and it, it is um, a time to sit back and, and take a look at, okay, where are we? So this is where we've been, and now we're going to look at a little bit of the neurobiology of the brain to help you understand what is happening inside you, and that this is also a collective experience as well. Mm -hmm. And you know, I just want to make one comment about this slide. You know, when we all look back to 9-11, I think we remember certain images that capture the 9-11 event. And when I think about COVID, I still remember seeing the pictures of New York City, Times Square, empty, and thinking, okay, that was shocking. And this image, I think, is really representative that we truly were living in a new world. And it was so interesting to observe some people taking a very renegade um, attitude, almost denial, like, oh, no, this isn't happening. You know, I'm doing the same thing I've always done. And then we saw the opposite extreme where there were some people who, you know, sheltered in place, cut off all social contact, never left their homes. Maybe they traveled, you know, to an island in Hawaii and didn't leave for nine months. And then we saw kind of everybody else in the middle scrambling to figure out, okay, how do we best, you know, how do we best deal with that? And I think those different responses also remind me of, how the brain can get activated under stress and some stress responses, while nothing is right or wrong, some are healthier than others. Right. So if we talk about the triune brain, um, let me pull that slide up. So this is the triune brain and this, I like that term because it basically breaks the brain down into three simple levels the neocortex, which is the rational or the thinking brain, which you can see illustrated by the blue, then the limbic brain, which is the emotional or feeling brain, and then the reptilian brain, which is the instinctual or survival brain. And it's the instinctual or survival brain that can get triggered when there is trauma. And in this case, I think we can loosely define COVID as a, as a trauma to our society and to us individually. So the nervous system defends itself with a couple of different mechanisms. So when there's a stressor, an activator, people either typically go into fight or flight mode, which is where they're ready to run, they're ready to activate, they're ready to do, do, do. They're gonna fix the problem and they're gonna fix it now. And that activation is what mobilizes us and moves us into action. That's typically a person's first response. Not always, but typically their first response to a trauma. Another thing, though, that can happen is either when the, paras when the sympathetic nervous system is activated for a long period of time and it can no longer sustain itself, or the person starts to feel helpless, that all they're doing is getting them nowhere they're in such a state of, state of hyperactivation that they drop into hypoactivation or freeze. And a freeze response is really about shutdown. In the wild, you would see it as an animal playing dead. In us, it looks more like, I'm not doing anything. I can't do anything. There is no solution. There's a bit of hopelessness 
depression, fatigue, not knowing, not thinking, and it's the complete office, opposite of that activation. So I'm wondering, Deborah, in your practice, can you think of times that you saw people moving into either fight or flight or a freeze response during the months of COVID? Well, I think that a lot, I mean, one of the things that I saw and have seen, although that has actually changed, I would say over the last month or so, but in the summer and leading into the fall, um, people really only gave COVID um, superficial acknowledgement. Everybody was still really kind of in denial about how long the duration was going to be and the long-term impact, you know. Um, but I think as the summer wore on and we began to see it and define it as the lost year, um, that, that began to change. And it became more and more central to people's stress levels. And um, it's almost like it is the one of the biggest things that is coming through the door versus the other psychological reasons people might have come in to see me. So everything is amplified and everything is made bigger because of what's happening with COVID and the political landscape. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty out there and um, people are looking for ways to manage that uncertainty. And, um, you know, and I think the other thing that happens with this that I have seen is that kind of powerlessness, you know, kind of an, an impulse to give up. Uh, it doesn't matter. And those are the things that really the brain is taking us into a place of inactivity. And um, we're going to talk at some point about the antidote to that uh, brain state. Uh, but yeah, I have seen that. We're just holding out on people to get to the anecdote. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, and it's always interesting, I think, for people to find that, you know, the balance between, okay, there's something that must be done, it must be fixed, we're coming up with a solution, why aren't these people coming up with a solution, and complete, you know, throwing their arms in the air and saying, well, there's nothing to be done. And I think when our brains and our nervous systems are swinging us, you know, into these polarizing positions, it is a very, very difficult to move out of it and find that middle ground, which is perhaps a lot healthier. Um, because our entire system is affected by these stress responses. So just as an example on this slide, you know, your heart rate increases, um, you may get shaky, your mouth can get dry, your vision sharpens, um, your digestion slows, I mean, these are all characteristic symptoms are fight or flight. And what I always see in my practice when people are in fight or flight mode, one of the first things to go is sleep because people are so amped up and restless. They're tossing, they're turning, they're waking up, they're thinking, they're trying to go to sleep. They're working so hard to go to sleep. And when you're working hard to go to sleep, you know, that's the moment you just can never sleep. So you know, really trying to help people shift out of fight or flight and into a healthier um, place, I think that really does represent the challenge. So Deborah, do you wanna talk a little bit about the thinking brain versus the survival brain? Yeah, and you jump in at any point here too. Okay. Um, basically, I wanna just point out one thing on the slide, the previous slide oh, about tunnel vision. No, and it's just, I'll just add to this. Um, one of the things I see really often when people are feeling trauma, so we can have a difficult life experience that doesn't necessarily translate to trauma, but um, it becomes tra trauma when we start to stay in that period or place of um, psychological, emotional overwhelm and feel powerless and helpless to do anything. And what happens neurobiologically uh, one of the things I see is that that the brain actually pulls in um, your visual uh, landscape so that you see less of the options that might be available to you. And so when we go into the strategies for overcoming fight or flight, it's really important to understand those strategies literally open up possibility for you. 
Um, and so that's one of the pieces we're going to be talking about too when we talk about the strategies is they that we keep we either close things down or we open them up and see what is ahead of us and how we can maneuver through whatever comes our way. Oh, and when we see people open up, I think we really get out of that polarization as well. It just Completely. never really happens. Completely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this slide basically is um, just a little tutorial on um, the thinking brain and the survival brain. And um, basically, uh, if we use some of the language from the economist um, Daniel Kahneman, he talks about it as uh, thinking fast and thinking slow. So the survival brain is the fast brain. And it is wired to perceive threat and actually can perceive threat from our thoughts. If we're having scary thoughts all the time, it's going to activate the fast brain. And so it's assessing in just microseconds uh, uh, threat uh, potential, and it, it activates the stress response. All of this is part of implicit memory, so it's not in our conscious awareness. Um, the way that we can tell it's been activated is not through thinking about it, but in becoming aware of what is happening on the inside in our bodies. Our bodies are telling the story. And so it is noticing that my heart rate is up or that I'm feeling um, shaky or panicky or that, um, you know, other signals that the body is giving us that it's been uh, the survival brain has been activated. Um, and this brain is also part of the system that is meant to give us rest and recovery when it is calm. When it's not calm, it's not going to um, allow us because it's, it's basically functioning on the belief that uh, we're in some sort of um, threatening situation. Um, and the other part of it, and this is true with... Um, all parts of the brain and body, but the greater the stress level, the more the survival brain learns and remembers. So it's really um, bookmarking anything through our lifespan that is overwhelming or doesn't make sense to us. And so we can be triggered from things um, that have happened to us earlier in our lives. And some of that is probably happening right now with COVID and uh you know, with other events going on in the world. The thinking brain is the slow brain, and it is responsible for executive function, and executive function is the part of us that is able to uh, bring information to our forefront of our brain and think through a problem to slow the whole thing down and gets us into response patterns versus reaction. Um, it allows us to see the bigger picture and then bring it back down to size. Um, it has to do with helping us consciously pace ourselves, decision-making, willpower. And this is where we get explicit memory. So this is memory that we have access to um, and we can rely mm -hmm. on our history. I've been here before. Uh, these are the things that worked in the past. Let me see how they do now. Um, and the thinking brain functions are reduced under chronic stress and trauma. Um, the good news is that there are things that we can do to really boost it and to um, make it more likely um, and intentional for us to access the thinking brain and slow things down. You know, I was thinking another way of saying thinking brain versus survival brain would be to say that when you're in survival brain, all you can see are the trees and you can't see the forest. And it was reminding me of a, a Marine that I was treating who when he would have flashbacks or even in the office, he would go back to the war and be back in survival brain. All he could be in was that hypervigilant self where he was seeing all these little tiny details about the war, but he couldn't move into thinking brain and give himself the update that no, here you are in the present moment and the war is over. So he was just lost in those trees and he couldn't see the forest, he couldn't see the big picture. And I think you know, that is representative of so many of us when we get stressed 
and we get focused on these micro details that seem in the moment so very important. That's our survival brain. But if we can't step back and get that larger perspective, I think we list, lose out on you know the real possibility of much better problem solving and perspective taking. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So, all right. So the news is not all bad. Let me say this: mm -hmm. that there are there are going to be some positive outcomes from COVID. Um, and we will be studying this for many, many years to come. Um, an example of this, though, that uh, is being looked at by neuroscientist David Eagleman at Stanford is the very real possibility that because we have had to um, challenge our brain's working models of reality because they've been flipped upside down in all sorts of ways, um, that that is forcing our brains to rewire themselves and we are live wired for change and growth. And he is predicting that there will be a decrease in uh, dementia among people who are 60 years or older right now. So, wow, who would have thought that was gonna come down the pike? Um, other things have been people's um, ability to kind of reassess their lives and who they are I think a lot of young people are stepping back and this has accelerated their decisions and um, ideas about what direction to take in their own lives. Um, and it has, you know, in some places caused us to really reassess our own values and where we wanna put time and energy and resources. So I, I think that there will be some very positive things that will come out of the reorganization of our families and our, our society and uh, communities. Um, and the good news is there is a way through and um, that can be developed right now and it's pretty straightforward to miss it. Um, well, maybe, maybe that is building resilience. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was thinking, well, maybe this would be a part, no, a no. time for us to maybe step back and explain from our positioning and our work with trauma and how we have developed a more of a non pathologizing way of looking at stress, trauma, and how that definitely impacts our perspective on what is resilience, how to develop resilience. So maybe we should give, do you wanna give a brief intro on that so that people can understand how our thinking may be different from other psychologists, psychiatrists? Yeah, I mean, Jane and I have been doing a lot of work together and the model for looking at all of these survival strategies or any coping skill is to really look at the, the positive impulse behind it. Even if it's upside down, it is part of the brain and body's mechanisms to help us uh, navigate through life. And we, just absolutely don't give a negative connotation to any of this stuff. We do not pathologize it, which is our language for saying, make it something that is about a character flaw or a defect in a person. It's really understanding where those coping skills have emerged from. And while there may be consequences for certain um, coping skills, it is understanding that there is a basic value. And, and the other thing we have done a lot of work with is understanding how the body itself is working um, to regain equilibrium when it's lost. And it has a lot to tell us um, through the body's wisdom. We're, we're learning a lot mm -hmm. and it's very healing and powerful. Mm -hmm. And we really try to apply that model to COVID because you know, we could look at COVID, COVID as this is a terrible thing that's happened and it's all bad. And that's not to minimize or mitigate some of the negative impact that will come, that has come from COVID and the deep stress that it has created. 
but to say, you know, that's not the only way of looking at it. And we can also look at it as a potential opportunity. And I read something that said, you know, COVID is the opportunity to either go through a portal to a new place, a new dimension, <laughs> or to go down the rabbit hole. And which is it that you want to do? And it's pretty easy to fall and go into the rabbit hole. I think we've all been there. It happens. That's okay. But we also have the opportunity to say, hey, you know what? I want to take this and I want to go through the portal and I want to fly higher. What might that look like and how might I achieve that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's dive right in. I'm looking at the time and let's get um, to what is the solution and looking at resilience um, and how it involves five key steps. Um, and again, this is going to sound simplistic, but this is where the research is on how to overcome these kind of adversities in our lives and actually become more agile um, uh, just more um, able to pivot around difficulties um, to um, just remain flexible and be able to get into uh, a balanced state of mind much faster. So the first one is that we need eight hours of sleep and we need eight hours of quality sleep. Um, Jane, you can probably speak to this. You were talking about it a little bit earlier and I can add anything um, else to it, but it, it is essential. Um, Absolutely. All the studies. You know, when you're talking to your clients, what? Oh. Yeah. I mean, all the studies show that when we try to deprive ourselves of sleep, our cognitive functioning goes down significantly. And there's no amount of caffeine or Adderall or Red Bull that's going to bring you back online to your fullest capacity. And over time, you know, that sleep deprivation results in greater and greater cognitive deficits. And what's happened is people forget to notice, or I shouldn't say forget, they're not able to notice, to notice the changes in their cognitive functioning and the, specifically the decline in their cognitive functioning. So sleep deprived states become the new normal. And that's not healthy because we see there are more errors made more traffic accidents, more relationship problems. And in our society, you know, we try to shortcut sleep because we want to work more, do more, go harder. But the reality is we are really um, cutting ourselves out of something that's so fundamental to healthy day-to-day -day living. Yeah. And it really is, sleep is the time when there is repair and recovery in the brain and the body, cell renewal. And there's also clear evidence that um, getting adequate sleep um, is part of our whole immune functioning and ability to um, recover or to fight off um, any kind of illness. So it's, you know, it really is a vital piece of building resilience. Um, the second part of it is, is diet and nutrition. 70% of our immune system is located in the gut intestinal biome. And so if we are looking at following a mostly plant-based diet, um, limiting alcohol consumption, um, especially if it is uh, more in the direction of, of wine versus uh, distilled spirits, uh, the research says that this can make a huge difference in our overall functioning and cognitions and ability to make, remain calm in difficult situations. So we, you know, this is kind of an easy, easy direction to go in. Um, number three is exercise. And again, no surprise there. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, the, uh, extreme exercise if that's what makes you feel good then that's what you need to do but it can be a walk it can be um uh you know whatever it is that makes you feel good exercise wise um there is some evidence that body-based exercises like pilates or yoga um really kind of can be a part of building 
on some other aspects of um, resilience. But, um, you know, it is whatever makes you feel. Oops, I think we lost Deborah. We lost Deborah. <laughs> All right, well, I'll just pick up from here. Okay. You know, exercise increases endorphins, especially if you get your heart rate up. And when she was talking about the mind body connection, I think when we're looking at moving people out of fight or flight, getting into their bodies, you know, we can't think our way out of fight or flight mode or freeze mode. We can only feel through our bodies how to get out of those different types of modes. I don't know, maybe she's coming back online with us. Yeah, great. Here she is. Sorry. Did yeah, we, all, we found her. Did we all come back? <laughs> you and I, you and I can yeah. just finish each other's sentences. So I'm like, okay, I'll just go pick up That's from great. here. I love it. <laughs> so we're good. So we were okay. just, I was okay. just saying how we can't, you know, we can't think our way out of fight or flight or freeze mode. We have to feel. And when you were talking about yoga, Pilates, um, I'm even a big fan of, I got to give a plug to Tracy Anderson. I don't know if um, anybody out there has done the Tracy Anderson method, but what I love about it is it is sort of a combination of bar class, Pilates, floor, mat work. But what she always emphasizes is feeling, you know, making that mind body connection and really feeling what it is that your body is doing and being bringing a lot of awareness and that awareness in and of itself is so healing. And I think that is what allows us to connect to what our body is feeling, what our body is needing, what our body needs more of, where our body needs less of, and just making those small um, changes and where we're really, really listening to what we need. That's the kind of, that's when exercise gets interesting. You know, and that's not just jumping on the treadmill and forcing yourself to do 45 minutes. That's saying, hey, I'm really listening to myself in a deeper way that feels really good. So now I really want to do this. I'm enjoying this. This yeah. is good for me on many levels. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that um, the other part that that piece of resilience builds is um just our connectivity with our inner world, our inner lives. And there's there's a lot to be gained from that awareness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know there's a lot of emphasis on meditation. I do put a lot of emphasis on that with my clients. And a lot of people will say, well, I don't think I do it right, or it doesn't really seem to work for me. And, and here's the story on that, is that meditation works whether you think it is or not. You know, the, the, <laughs> you just have to do it. You have to put on the headphones or you have to quiet your brain or try to. It doesn't matter if you accomplish it. You The effort on this level is really valuable. Oh, definitely. And you know what, Liz, don't get um, Deborah and I started on meditation because that's a whole new webinar. <laughs> yeah, well, I know I have a monkey brain. So. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, said. I actually think we could do a webinar on meditation alone. Because, you know, I've been meditating now seriously for five, six, maybe seven years. Time flies by. <laughs> and uh, I really do believe it is the cornerstone of good mental health. And, you know, Deborah, I, you and I think so similarly. But, you know, meditation is many different things. When you're exercising, that can be meditation. When you're doing laundry, that can be meditation. I hate doing the dishes. But I hate it. But what I try to do is say, okay you know what? Wash on, wash off. <laughs> Into the dishwasher and just let my mind release. Walking the dog, you know, playing catch with my son, um, cleaning, not a big fan of cleaning, but if I can get myself into that state of just relaxed, calm, where my thoughts are flowing, I'm not attaching to any one thing. I'm just kind of letting it go. That's a form of meditation, too. Everyone thinks meditation has to be quiet mind. Well, eventually, yes, that's the goal. That's where we all hope to get to. But we know that, you know, for most of us, that's not going to be possible every day. Um, but, you know, just getting into that flow state is really a form of meditation. Yeah, it definitely is. And it can be anything from, you know, my husband does these um, long, long hikes, 150 miles over 10 days or 200 miles over 10 days. And 
that is his zen. That is yeah. his flow state. And I know we have some clients that are on the West Coast and enjoy surfing. Another example of, oh. you know, mm -hmm. being in nature and having that is meditative. Exactly. So we exactly. can expand our definition of what that means. Um, so the last key element of resilience is social connectivity. And um, this really speaks to how valuable the quality of our relationships are to keeping us healthy and grounded and having a sense of well-being and meaning in our lives. Um, and over and over, uh, when we cultivate rich circles of connection, um, the research shows us that it is really like um, protection against all the vagaries of life and that we do need to have people that we can share our pain with, not to solve it, but just to hear us. And maybe that's your spouse. Maybe it's your best girlfriend. Maybe it's your circle or circles of friends. Um, but these are, these are things that money cannot buy. And they're things that are worth putting the time and energy into cultivating and creating meaning in those relationships and, and putting the time into it. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be with people outside our family. It can be with our children. Um, they need those connections with us as much as we need them from them. And helping others is another way to really deepen a sense of social connection and adding value in our lives and value in other people's lives. Um, and, you know, I think the other part of it, it kind of like meditation, is that if you're not the person that wants to share, you're the self-sufficient person who doesn't enjoy doing that, then, then help somebody else because the benefits are the same going in either direction. Mm, that's a really good point. I love that. Thank you for saying that. And, you know, COVID has brought us the opportunity, like you were alluding to, Deborah, to deepen our conversations. So it's not just about going out and, you know, having dinners or, you know, going to the movies and just engaging in more superficial activities. COVID has given us the opportunity to really say, you know, how are you doing? Are you okay? Do you need anything? How can I help you? How's your family doing? How are your kids doing? Oh, how are your mom and dad? And I love the fact that it has deepened our conversations and actually has brought us today to this moment where we were able to do our webinar. Yeah, it really has. <laughs> yeah. And I said, I meet Liz. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Liz. Yes. Well, thank you both. Yes. All right. Well, I think, did we have a question for Liz? Because we oh, were we did. We were Wait talking about how is COVID <laughs> affecting her and her business? And how did we formulate our question, Deborah? Do you remember? Well, I think that the question really has to do with where you see resilience being valuable for your clients in making, having financial planning and making financial decisions. Yeah. Well, okay. So first I have to share this quote with you that was just shared with me earlier this week. Um, it's a quote by um, Sherry Mandel. Um, Resilience is not about overcoming, but becoming. Mm -hmm. And I just love that. It resonates throughout every aspect of life to me. But, you know, a financial plan is like setting up a responsive plan. I mean, that's exactly what it is. So financial resilience is about understanding what risks you might face the probabilities of those risks and how to avoid any damage and minimize the impact. So we really do have to focus on things that we can control because we do know we will withstand, we will recover. So we have to focus really, you know, what what is on what is important and what is my why. We have to continually reassess what is my why, what is my purpose, and you know, I think. Um, adding humor and laughing um, is always a great way because you know we can put these financial plans together all day long, but life throws us all these curveballs that we have no idea. Um, but we have a plan and we can pivot um, using your term, Deborah. And I think it's always better to make um, decisions when you aren't in a stress response. 
Um, and it's really our job as advisors to provide that stability and strength um, to our clients as we help them navigate these conversations. And uh, flexibility, I think, it is key. Um, I have a question for you as a tag on. Now, yep. I know you're not a psychologist, and I'm not asking you to be one. But from our conversations, I know how much you care about your clients. And so when you're in your financial brain, <laughs> right? But then you get <laughs> <Yeah, the> school <laughs> brain. brain. I, don't, I don't have that financial brain. But when you're in that, I've heard of it. I know it does exist. So when you're in there, but then you get worried that, hey, maybe your clients are coming to you and they're, they're coming from that stress response or they're in fight or flight or they're shutting down. How do you... I know you try to shift them out, but how do you try to shift them or get them to see, you know, the forest for the trees? And how do you well, have the conversation yeah. with them? Well, luckily, you know, we have really deep relationships with our clients. And so, you know, one of the first things that we do as we're getting to know each other is, you know, what is this all for? What is the plan? What it is? What is it that you're trying to accomplish? Oh. And then we fo refocus them back and reframe. Okay, yes, we might be experiencing this right now. However, this is our long-term view, and we're okay. It's okay. And so, really refocusing them on on what their objectives are. You know, there might be, there is going to be noise along the way, but you know, we have a plan for a reason. Um, we can pivot. Um, we have to get through the short term um, and just refocus them back on what is this all for? And it's their why. Yeah. Well, life. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's life. And you know, I think the other thing is um, with financial planning is. We have to have involvement from our clients. I can't do it for them, right? With no involvement, there is no commitment, right? They have to be as committed to it as I do as an advisor. Um, so, well, it sounds like there's meaning underneath the plan. What is it for? Because the accumulation of money, and this is just my opinion, for the accumulation itself doesn't provide much meaning or purpose. But if you have the why, then it all really starts to matter a whole lot more. There's no satisfaction in the accumulation. You know, we all think that there is and we all want to keep jumping up the ladder. And, you know, once you get there, you're like, well, now what? Right. Yeah, if there's yeah. no meaning or purpose behind it, it, I mean, there's it doesn't make any sense. So, yeah, yeah. Well, I think you're I think you're more than a psychologist. I think you're a <laughs> <laughs> I think I should have an honorary degree. <laughs> Maybe you can give it to me, Dr. Kaplan. I do know that we are coming um, up to the end of our session. And thank you both very much. This was very helpful. I loved uh, going through it. And as we were putting it together, it was really fun. <laughs> Um, but I do. There is one question I think that I, I hear a lot um, and we're probably seeing it <laughs> more and more each day, um, especially with the markets reacting. Um, but it looks like we are possibly heading into the third cycle of COVID. Um, we're already exhausted. You know, we're zoomed out. <laughs> we're tired of being locked up for lack of a, a better term. Um, so what do we do? What do we do now? You know, when, when you mentioned when we were prepping for this that we may be wearing face masks for another year, I hit that feeling of, whoa, the wall, the wall. And so what I try to do with myself in general when I hit that wall, that metaphorical but real wall, I accept that sometimes my initial reaction to that may be negative or I may feel overwhelmed or think it's too difficult. And then I try to step back and say, but what is my learning opportunity here? Mm -hmm. And when I notice my own emotional reaction, I accept it for what it is. And then I just try to grow it. You know how Deborah was saying, hey, in fight or flight, our vision gets very narrow, but if we can open up, we can really see the other possibilities. Right. So I try to see the other possibilities and those don't always come the minute I ask, or the day I ask, or the week I ask, or the month I ask, sometimes even the year I ask. But typically when I can step back into that space and ask those questions, I do start to see things 
a bit differently, more positively. And we always know that we all have areas for growth and expansion and that's never ending and that's continual and that's a part of the human condition. And that's a good thing. Yeah, that's a good reminder. We might not get all the answers all at once. You know, we, we want that instant gratification, but. Always. <laughs> well, Deborah, do you have anything you want to add? I know we're at the end of our time. Well, I think that Jane said it so beautifully. I think that's where we can hit the pause button and say thank you so much for letting us be a part of this, Liz. Oh, thank you so much for joining me today. And yes, it was fun. And I let's do this again. Let's do part okay. two. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody who is tuning in. This was I hope you found this just as valuable as I did personally going through it. So thank you, Jane and Deborah. And we will see you again soon and have a great afternoon. You do the same, Liz. We'll talk to you okay. soon. Okay. okay. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Bye bye. Bye bye.